coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition. The San Diego Convention Center is a lot closer to getting a lot bigger. We'll speak with the man behind the expansion project. And our viewers speak out against a UT San Diego editorial pitching another convention center plan. We'll have your comments on Doug Manchester's Grand Waterfront vision. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Ferrian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. Sheriff Bill Gore says San Diego County is a lot safer tonight after a huge sweep of suspected gang members. 104 people were arrested in early morning raids across the county. Authorities say two of the suspects were top leaders of the Mexican Mafia. San Diego has taken the next step to expanding the convention center. The city council approved a special district to finance the $520 million project. Next, hotel owners will vote by mail on a room rate surcharge to raise money. City officials say they will have a final financing plan next month, and Mayor Jerry Sanders says he wants to break ground on the expansion by the end of the year. Union leaders say the project won't create quality jobs, and they say they will fight it. And we'll have more on this in just a few moments at the round table. The California State University system has changed the rules for paying new university presidents. Now they can only make 10 percent more than their predecessors. The change comes after CSU officials were criticized for approving a $400,000 yearly salary for San Diego State President Elliot Hirschman, while CSU budgets were getting cut and tuition was going up. Three San Diego congressmen have proposed a bill to protect the cross on Mount Soledad and other religious-themed war memorials. KPBS Home Post blogger Beth Ford Roth is following this story. She joins us from the News Center. So, Beth, who's proposing this legislation and why now? Well, uh, three Republican congressmen from San Diego County, uh, Brian Bilbray, Daryl Issa, and Duncan Hunter, Jr., are proposing the bill to protect religious symbols that are part of war memorials. And why they're doing it now, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, the people behind the bill say it's uh, a chance to support our veterans as uh, we're losing so many of them in Afghanistan. And also, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled on the Mount Soledad Cross on the constitutionality of it a year ago. And the Supreme Court has until February to decide whether or not to take up that case. So the timing could have something to do with it. Also, it's an election year, and this may be a way to uh, support the base, so to speak. Yeah, we are in an election year. What are the chances this bill will pass in the U.S. Senate? Well, um, it passed the House yesterday, but as we know, the House is a uh, Republican majority body. Now, the Senate is not, and so there may be a little more difficulty getting it through that House. And then also, if it uh, makes it through both houses, it will land on the president's desk, and there's been no word from the Obama administration whether or not uh, the president would sign such a bill. All right. KPBS Home Post blogger, Beth Ford Roth. At the roundtable tonight, Joanne takes a closer look at the San Diego Convention Center expansion and a competing plan unveiled by the UT San Diego this week. As you just heard, the city of San Diego moved the convention center expansion another step closer to reality. But this move comes amid questions about whether the city has the power to approve a hotel tax increase and just how much of the $520 million price tag will come from the city's general fund. And of course, there is the elephant in the room. This editorial, take a look from Sunday's paper, pushing a different plan for the convention center expansion. Now, this is a much larger plan that includes a new stadium, and arena at the waterfront. Joining me to sort through all of this is Steve Cushman. He has served on more than 60 boards in San Diego, including the Port Commission. He's currently on the Convention Center Board of Directors and is special liaison to the mayor on the expansion project. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to be here. I want to start uh, with the, this tax um, that hotels will basically pass on to people who stay at their hotel. Uh, the union, we spoke with somebody from the union representing hotel workers who said today, hey, we think this is illegal. Uh, this a kind of vote like this has to go to the people. What do you say? Well, in each case uh, in America, we have the opportunity to agree and disagree. We believe using the Melrose tax basis that it is 100% legal, 
Obviously, there will be a validation action. The city has said that they will do, so everybody will have an opportunity to go to court, and somebody in a black robe will say, yes, it's okay, or no, it isn't. We believe that it will hold up, and it will hold up in court. Melrose, which is why some of us pay additional taxes to live in certain neighborhoods, to go to certain schools using that Exactly that correct, precedent. and that is the way to explain it, because that's what we all know. You know, we right. each pay those type of taxes. We feel that is appropriate here. Uh, the, the next step, however, is before we can get to any of that, we had to get through yesterday's action with the council forming the district, and now they will, on the 25th of March, send out ballots to the hotels, and on April the 23rd, the results will be announced to the city council. Assuming two-thirds of the hoteliers say that they are willing to do this, then we have a project. If, unfortunately, they didn't, we wouldn't have a project. Now, we also have the issue of how much of this funding will come from the general fund. Right now, it's pegged at $3.5 million, but it's also contingent upon the hotels increasing the taxes, raising enough money, people staying at their hotels, and we don't have a cap on this liability to the public. Is that a concern? Let me uh, try to... Un, un, uh, unanswer what you just said. That wasn't quite right. What we will be asking the City Council in May as part of the financing plan is to commit three and a half million per year capped maximum of the new 12.7 million in TOT tax that will be collected by the hotels. There will be a cap. It's three and a half million for 30 years. Yesterday's meeting, the issue of a cap came up, and um, I believe Carl DeMaio brought it up, and he was told, too late, you can't introduce a cap now. There was a great misunderstanding yesterday of, of what the cap was, whether there's a cap. What Carl uh, didn't understand at the time was, that wasn't on the agenda yesterday. We were only formulating a district yesterday. So it will go on the agenda? It will go How on the agenda. How can you guarantee that all the city councilors will approve it? We'll uh, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> we had a 6-2 vote yesterday. In December the 6th, we had a 6-2 vote. You know, hopefully in May, when we present our financing plan, the City Council will believe that it is realistic, that it answers all the questions that they have, gives them all the assurance that they want to make sure that it's done properly. What you have to understand is that in the numbers that the City staff has built on this project, they have said in the first five years there will be five, six percent inflation in the TOT. After that, they built zero inflation for 25 years. That's the insurance that I believe the city council needs to give to the citizens of San Diego that no matter what happens, there'll be plenty of money to cover the debt service. But that $12.7 million of revenue that you're counting on in terms of introducing this new tax says that people will continue to visit San Diego, they'll continue to stay in those hotels, and they'll, they'll pay that amount in tax. You, I mean, you still take some risk. Well, I guess if the sun stops shining in San Diego, and assuming that uh, there aren't any more adverse national effects, uh, you know, you always worry about a 9-11 issue. Uh, but uh, even after those types of issues, we had a recession in the last couple of years, but everything continued to go forward. We continue to meet all of our obligations in this city. Our mayor has done a wonderful job of getting us to a point where we can now look at a balanced budget. So I don't think it's a very big risk. I think it's an appropriate risk for government to take. I want to turn to Doug Manchester and the UT San Diego. A lot of people in the community are talking about this Sunday's paper, front page story, which in fact was an editorial, that, that proposes this grand plan, the idea that um, we can build a, a new stadium, a new charger stadium, a new arena, and expand convention center space at the waterfront. Not, not the same expansion that, that you're proposing to do. Um, what do you think of the plan? Well, it's bold, it's visionary, but let's look at reality. The plan is like an old car with a new paint job. We've been down this route. The voters said on Prop B, 70% we want 10th Avenue to remain. Now, I was a port commissioner then, so I spoke out on the issue at that time. I'm not a port commissioner today, so from that standpoint, I am not a spokesperson on that project. I can simply tell you that 10th Avenue Marine Terminal is a terminal today, will continue to be a terminal. It is a wonderful asset for San Diego, provides hundreds and hundreds of jobs. It is a strategic port, one of only 14 in the United States. I don't believe it's going anywhere. 
But as you said earlier, the issue is, you know, should the Union Tribune have had it on the front page or not? You know, I would tell you, John, I was raised in the newspaper business, spent the first 20 some years of my life doing everything from being a paper boy to setting type to selling advertising, all of the above. The wonderful opportunity one has when they own a newspaper is you can bring your ideas to the forefront of the community, cause debate. That's what they were doing, and I think they did a fine job of it. It's certainly their right. They own the newspaper, and so it's their opportunity to do what they want to do. We, we had um, several of our audience members write in to us, and later on in the program in our public square, we're going to be uh, showing people some of their comments. But basically, to sum up, a lot of people were upset that he used the front page of the paper to do this. And a lot of people said this. They said, you know what? Fix our potholes. Keep our libraries open. Do the basics rather than in, invest in plans like this. Your, your plan says let's expand. What do you say to those people? We don't, we don't have a lot of time left, but what do you say to them? First of all, let me say this. The monies that we are going to create here will help create jobs, 11,000 of them to be exact, 7,000 permanent, 4,000 part-time jobs uh, in construction. But more importantly, we are going to create an economic engine that will help this community fix potholes and bring police and fire because there will be millions of dollars on an annual basis that will flow through this community because we expanded the convention center. We're out of time. We'd love to talk more about those jobs. I know the union wants to talk more about the quality of those jobs. But Steve Cushman, thank you so much for being here. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Helping returning veterans make the transition from the battlefield to the home front. We'll have a look at a San Diego program in just a moment. And a border monument is now south of the border fence. We'll tell you about an effort to get the fence moved. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, visit an island in Alaska home to some 1,700 Alaskan brown bears, a unique circle of life that's played out for centuries. Fortress of the Bears on nature. Then at 9, how did science and technology help reveal the truth about an undiscovered Leonardo da Vinci painting? Find out on Nova. And at 10, two huge pythons are dissected to reveal the science of slithering on Inside Nature's Giants. That's tonight on KPBS. She shot to start him. She never missed. And became an American icon. There's never been anybody like Annie Oakley. This sweet person, but with this big bang gun. But at the height of her popularity, scandal threatened to bring her down. This newspaper report came out just dragging her into the gutter. Annie Oakley. She's such a complicated package. On American Experience. Tuesday at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by San Diego is home to more than more military veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan than any other city in the nation. The numbers are growing as the war winds down. For those suffering from serious injury, be it physical or mental, the VA transition team is there to help. From the battlefield to the field of dreams, Nels Cooper Brannon always wanted to be a Marine, but it all ended on his second tour in Fallujah, Iraq, when his left hand was partially blown off from a grenade. Debbie Dominic runs the VA transition team for seriously injured vets. She says Cooper underwent about 15 surgeries at Balboa Hospital. He, he was involved in a radio talk show while he was recovering, and um, the owner of the Padres at the time was involved in that talk show. She says a friend of Cooper's mentioned he used to pitch, and the Padres should give him a tryout. So he did. He went out and pitched for them, and they drafted him. Cooper Brandon, I'm a pitcher with the San Diego Padres. Uh, in a former Marine. Dominic has seen many success stories like that. She manages 22 transition team members in San Diego whose primary goal is to extend a warm hand of help, gratitude, and counseling when needed. We're serving 8,000 in this facility currently and we're expecting as the, um, the war turns down to another 17,000. Bo Trey says when he got out of the Marines he thought he was done. He's now a transition patient advocate for the VA he says many vets 
don't connect their service with what happened to them in the field, and some of the scars aren't visible. The expectation is that we find a way to manage it and continue with completing the mission. And that doesn't stop the day you take the uniform off. It doesn't stop when you receive your discharge papers. Veteran Nels Cooper Brannon made another transition after pitching for the Padres in the minor leagues for two years. He's now studying to be a pharmacist. The final defendant in the largest Iraq war crimes case against U.S. troops will not serve any time in the brig. Frank Wooderich pleaded guilty to dereliction of duty in a case that has raised questions about ethics on the battlefield. Joanne has more on this with her guests at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The case of Frank Wooderich, along with the release of video showing U.S. troops urinating on corpses of Taliban fighters, has raised ethical and moral questions about combat. Joining me is Professor Martin Cook. He is in town today for the James Bond Stockdale Leadership Symposium tonight and author of the book, The Moral Warrior, Ethics and Service in the U.S. Military. He is also Stockdale Chair of Professional Military Ethics, and that is at the Naval War College. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Thank Cook. You. So first of all, I, I just want to remind our audience now, you, you'll be speaking about Admiral Stockdale. Remind us all why he is the touchstone of, for really military ethics. I think two main reasons. He was, of course, our senior prisoner of war in Vietnam. And in that role, he was horribly tortured and, and maintained his integrity a great deal. And he effectively led the other prisoners and helped them get through that experience. So he's much admired for that. And then I think the other reason is uh, he was a scholar. He wrote quite a lot. Uh, he has a book called Thoughts of a Philosophical Fighter Pilot. And very few other military leaders of similar experience have been as reflective as he is about what got him through it. Now, as you know, our community and really uh, much of the country has been talking about the Haditha verdict. Um, are we in a position to pass moral judgment in terms of what happens in combat? Well, I think we are. I mean, of course, what we always want to know is what really happened, right? What are the real facts? And I think in this case, that's a little hard to discern accurately. But one of the things we expect leaders at every level to do is to maintain fire discipline, that is to be careful about who they shoot at and when they shoot. And if he made, gave the order that he appears to have given, that would be essentially indiscriminate, and that would be clearly a violation of his obligations as a leader. We've had a number of guests on the show in the past several weeks, weeks come in and say, you know, though, we can't understand what it's like to be in combat. They were scared. He was scared. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they mm -hmm. had just, he had just seen his friend blown up, that, that we might not get it. Is, is that fair? Well, I think it's partially fair. Uh, that's one of the reasons why when we have trials of these people, they're tried by other military people who've been there and done that. Um, I think it is difficult, imagine, if you've never been in the environment, and I haven't either, to fully understand all of the things that go on. But the people who design military training are very well aware of all the emotions that go with combat. And that's the whole point of military training, is to cope with those effectively and keep things under control that could really get out of control. But aren't troops actually trained to, to sort of uh, become desensitized to the enemy? Aren't they kind of uh, trained to go in and, and, and maybe ignore that, that these are women and children or a man in a wheelchair? Isn't that part of what they're, they're asked to do? No. Uh, they're, they're trained to respond automatically according to the way they've been trained. Right? But that, that training does not include what you just said. Part of that training is, in fact, to, to know how to carefully discriminate what they can shoot at and what they can't, right? Um, so there are scenarios where they could shoot at targets that appear to be civilian, and the part of the training is to keep the emotions under control and take the time, what little time you have, to make the best judgment possible that this is a legitimate target. Now, early on in testimony in this trial, there was testimony that said after the uh, five men were shot in the vehicle that some of the um, troops in that squad were urinating also on dead bodies, right. which reminds us of the other very mm -hmm. high um, uh, profile incident that we're all talking about, and Woodrich told them not to. Um, now, in this case, in terms of urinating, we know that there's been a high-profile case, um, Taliban corpses. Um, we're going to show a, a graphic. We want to warn our audience that it might be a little bit graphic. It does come from a, a Facebook page. But is this something that in training, this kind of, that, that troops are taught restraint? Um, well, it's clearly illegal. Um, there's, the law is there. Now, Honestly, I asked around, do people get trained specifically on the treatment of corpses as part of their law of armed conflict training? And the answer was probably not. That's a, that's a level of detail. You would sort of hope they would know that on general principles. But it's back to the military training thing. I mean, the impulse to desecrate 
the dead, especially if you just come out of a firefight and you're angry and you're upset, is is a known variable. I mean, we, we see it all the way back in in the Iliad, right, where where Hector dry, uh, is drugged through the dust of Troy by by Achilles, right? It's it's an it's a predictable human impulse. That's what military training is built to try to restrain. We have about 30 seconds before we have to go, but y you teach a very specific course. What, what do you think needs to be done so that out in combat um, troops are able to slow down and process this? Well, there are a lot of different things that happen. A, a good deal of it, frankly, is just the quality of the training. Very, very realistic training. So, for example, at the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, uh, the Army had to radically change that whole scenario. So there are civilians on the battlefield. There are villages they have to enter. There are negotiation with town people. So it's one of the jobs of the military is to make sure you're training for where you're actually going to go. And the truth is we weren't doing that when we first went. We were training for the Cold War. Okay, Dr. Cook, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Before there was a fence, all that marked the border between Mexico and the U.S. were stone and steel monuments, almost 300 of them dotting the southwestern landscape. But as the Border Patrol has reinforced the area with a new fence, many of these binational monuments have been left in Mexico. From our Fronteras desk, Adrian Florido has the story. Tractors rumble. Workers pour concrete from a rotating cement truck. A giant drill is carving a hole into the beach. On the scenic stretch of coast where San Diego County meets Tijuana, Mexico, the U.S. Border Patrol is making the border fence taller and thicker, impenetrable it hopes to drug smugglers and illegal crossers. But if you look closely through the vertical bars and double mesh, you can just make out a pyramid-shaped monument on the other side. As you can see, the border fence used to run right through the monument that marks the exact boundary between Mexico and the United States. But the Border Patrol has now moved the fence a few feet to the north, meaning that the monument is left entirely on the Mexican side. And that's upset locals because for decades, loved ones living on opposite sides of the border used to meet at the monument to talk through the fence. A border monument needs to be on the border, not just on one side or the other. It's a shared marker between two nations. Jim Brown is an architect and member of Friends of Friendship Park, an advocacy group that wants to convince the Border Patrol to reconsider its fence design. To have it, uh, the, the fence jog around and have it be almost ownership by Mexico doesn't make any emotional sense. It makes no physical sense makes no common sense. There are 276 of these monuments along the border from San Diego to El Paso. They were installed by Mexican and American surveyors starting in 1850 after a treaty ended the Mexican-American War and the two countries agreed to define their shared border. Today, some are in urban areas, others in remote desert or on isolated mountain bluffs. They're owned by both countries. But in the last several years, an increasing number of these binational monuments have become more like national monuments of Mexico alone. In 2006, Congress approved the construction of 700 miles of new fencing along the border. And as that fence has gone up, monuments have been left on the other side. The agency in charge of maintaining them is the International Boundary and Water Commission. The Border Patrol signed an agreement with them in 2008 to not disturb the monuments while constructing its fence. So in many places, like San Diego, it's built the fence a few feet north of the actual international boundary. The fence itself is constructed inside the United States. The actual agreement between the International Boundary and Water Commission and Customs and Border Protection is that any type of construction around a monument would be set back three feet. The Border Patrol also agreed to build doors into the barrier, as strange as that may sound. They're to allow for occasional maintenance of the monuments. David Taylor has been on a mission to photograph all 276 monuments since he realized the new fencing was going to make many of them inaccessible from the U.S. I recognized the fact that the border was going to change as much in the early 2000s as it had in the previous 100 years, more in fact. He believes the monuments, once a symbol of binational cooperation, have become casualties of the push for greater border enforcement. It's one of those very unfortunate situations where um, this thing that's a part of our shared heritage with Mexico is, is easily accessible. But Brown hopes to reverse that, at least in San Diego. He said he's come up with a relatively simple design change that would make the monument accessible from both sides. Jerry Conlin of the Border Patrol said the agency was always willing to listen. But border security is always the main focus. That is our mission, securing our borders, protecting our, the United States. But on the other side, visitors have already expressed their thoughts. An engraving on the monument warns vandals that defacing it is a crime punishable by the United States or Mexico. But someone recently used purple ink to cross out the words United States. 
That was Fronteras reporter Adrian Florido. Jim Brown's advocacy group plans to present an alternative design to the Border Patrol in a few weeks. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Gwen Eiffel. On the next news hour, the president hits the road to sell his economic blueprint for America's middle class. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. In his teen years, lots of people were saying they expected Bill Clinton to be president someday. They hated his guts and they would go to the end of the earth to destroy him. What a squandering of talent and possibility. Tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. A definitive look at the man and the president. Clinton on American Experience, Monday, February 20th at 9, only on PBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. The other day, I asked you about a front page UT San Diego editorial outlining Doug Manchester's vision of a developed waterfront with a new Charger Stadium, an arena, and more convention center space. The plan would require the approval of several state and federal agencies, probably a public vote, and at least $1.5 billion. As of now, it's just a pipe dream. Many of you had something to say. Carrie writes, never have I seen the front pages of a newspaper used to promote a project so one-sided. Shame on Manchester. As a former executive director of redevelopment, I don't support public tax dollars for stadiums. And Paul and Susan Mitchell say, we think it's absolutely despicable that the UT owner used the front page to promote his plan. Opinion belongs only on the editorial page in any newspaper. Joan Cuddy and Thomas Furley write, it is outrageous that the front page has an editorial, unless Birdsall says, where are the Manchester dreams coming from? Why does he want 10th Street Marine? Why does he want the 10th Street Marine complex? San Diego just went down that road to no avail. If the UT King wants influence, he'll have to do better than this proposal. Well, you can add your two cents on Twitter or on Facebook. And of course, you can always send me an email. Let me know if I can use your comments on air. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. More than 100 suspected gang members were arrested during a countywide sweep this morning. The FBI says two of the suspects are top leaders of the Mexican mafia. And San Diego hotel owners will vote on a proposed room rate surcharge to finance the expansion of the convention center downtown. City Council approved a special district to finance the project. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. And thanks for joining us. You have a great night.